Wasn't that awesome? Give it up. Give glory to God for Vicar Joe. Like, week after week, you are one of the best, um, honestly, like, children's messengers, messengers, you know, that I've ever, that I've ever seen. Love it. Today is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. The Christian life begins and ends with grace. Nothing more nothing less. Water poured over your head. It's by grace you're saved. At the moment you die, all you're going to need is grace to usher in the eternal kingdom. It starts and ends with grace. Until then, be his workmanship. There's a story told about a wealthy investor that had made a deal, and he, it was the right time for such a time as this. For him to leave, it's kind of a suburb where he lives, similar to Gilbert, but honestly was more heavenly than this even. And he wanted to go into a different world to see firsthand the plight of the poor. And he had chosen uh, to go to a homeless community in a neighboring town close to him in miles, but honestly it felt like a whole nother world from his perfect type universe that he lived in. As he drove, he saw a long line down the sidewalk of different people. They were holding bags, pushing carts, and he could tell this was the place for him to find what a lot of people were, were labeling those people. They were people who were down on their luck, down and out. And some of them, as he saw, even looked like they were near death, at least in their face and how they appeared and how they looked. The investor parked his Tesla in the parking lot. And thankfully, he had changed his clothes before he left. He, he changed from his Burberry suit to average clothes of the flesh shorts and a t-shirt he walked around the busy soup kitchen to see tons of people get in line and food was being poured from these big tin cans big pallet of just like corn slopped on people's plates he looked around in this mess hall and he saw a lot of people not smiling he saw a few smiling but what he noticed is that no one was really in relationship with other people he was sad he was sad that there wasn't a lot of conversation going around the tables. And although he thought, this is nice, there was a little glimmer of hope because people were having one meal and they needed that meal. He said, I'm going to do something different. I'm an investor. And I've left the suburbs with resources and a bank account and wealth more than everyone combined in that place. It was like he owned a cattle on a thousand hills. And he said, I'm going to help in a different way. I'm going to make an investment into a person. He noticed a gal outside in the alley, closed off from the world, shy, insecure, timid. She was sitting by the wall there. It was like she was barely breathing. He approached her slowly as if to say, I'm entering your world now. And the smell of her worn-out clothes hit him right in his senses. The investor was overwhelmed. Her clothes were like filthy rags, and he noticed a rash up and down her leg, and she just kept itching, itching it, and she had no ointment to help it. And then he looked, and he noticed her body. And he looked right here, and he saw some red sores, or so he thought. And then it clicked for him. It was like he had never seen this on a person's skin before, but maybe like you and I could recall from maybe documentaries or shows that we've seen the result of meth and needle points. What dope does to the body. The gal saw him looking at the arm, and she felt shame immediately. She pulled her long sleeve shirt down to cover up her shot-filled arms, filled with marks on her skin, and she smirked as a coping mechanism as she looked down at the ground. It's as if to say, <laughs> I know that look. I know that look of judgment. I've seen that before. And her internal uh, mechanisms was like a ping pong going back and forth. She was all over the place. Her head and mind were racing. There were voices in it. Maybe I am what they call me, she thought. Trash, junk, one of those people. If he only knew what I had been through, she thought. Abandonment, abuse, 
and all the trials of tough situations in life, I was trying just to fill the hole in my heart, the gap between the void. Whoa, 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 whoa. What's he doing? He's sliding down to sit next. No, no, he didn't. Yes, he did. He's sitting next to me now. Doesn't he know what I smell like? I sleep in my beat-up van, and I try to clean up. I take a bath down by the river, down the, by the canal, to visit my dad in a hospital to try to clean up. But as soon as I go in, I can't hide the smell and the stench and the look. But my dad's sick and dying, and so I must see him. And I think he's probably going to move on at some point. And he holds out his hand. He's voiceless. But yet then I notice his hand and the nail mark in his hand. But I, I'm not ready to grab his hand. I haven't actually touched anyone's hand except my dad's in, in 10 years because no one comes close to me. But I, I refuse him. And I figure he will go away, but he doesn't. He doesn't. He's not saying anything either, but just kind of hanging out. It's kind of like around a campfire where you're not saying anything maybe. You're just looking at the ground. But it kind of feels peaceful and calm. It's just not my normal. 30 minutes go by for the investor and the gal sitting there in an alley just kind of hanging out. And it's actually not awkward silence. It's actually very much a peaceful Silence. Now, don't get me wrong. There is noise all around. There's people that are actually drunk. There's people that are yelling at the wind. But for a moment, for just a split second, for just 30 minutes, she sits there, this gal, and she feels, and she's still, and she feels comfort and peace like she hasn't felt from any hit that she's had. And she hasn't even taken anything. It was Tuesday night. It was Tuesday night. And someone came out of the mess hall, and they started to talk into the community, and it broke the silence. This guy was yelling as if he was drunk, but he actually wasn't. He was just excited. Why? He started to yell, it's Tuesday night, and I'm going to church. It's Tuesday night, and I'm going to church. Tuesday night, and I'm going to church. And he walks right up to that gal. He's coming toward her. Brian is his name. He was in a wheelchair rolling down the alley. And Brian is a leader at his church. He had been homeless for a while, but he has, so, he has been homeless for a while, but somehow he was at that church that started five years ago, the first night it opened. And he hasn't tried to miss since. He hadn't always been in a wheelchair, but now he was bound to it. He had been shot a, y a few years ago after a run-in went south with a homeowner who he had all of his belongings, his whole life in a shed. It went bad. He was shot in the back, and the bullet left him paralyzed from the waist down. But get this, his perspective was better than most. You can oftentimes see Brian sitting in his chair, just kind of mumbling, just kind of whispering, God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. And other times he yells that out to the top of his lungs. The touching thing to know is that the church family in this community has been with him every step of the way. Visited him in the hospital and still visits him today. Brian rolled up to the gal, not even seeing the investor like he wasn't even there. And he looked at the gal and said, it's Tuesday you got to come to Homeless Church. It's Tuesday. And he hands her a flyer. He rolls through the alley, and he just keeps talking about the meal and the worship that everyone needs to be at. The gal thought to herself, <laughs> so many things going through her mind. What a joy, she thought. What a joy-filled person. If I could only have that joy, too. 
But then it quickly turns in her thoughts. I haven't been to church in a while. I, I think I would be judged at a church. I haven't been there so long. I don't even know. What does it mean to be homeless in a church? Homeless church, is it a mix of people? Is it just homeless people? I mean, the churches I'm used to, everyone has everything together on the outside, but on the inside, they're wrecked. But they might just not share that. The investor didn't want to scare her off. But he did want to get closer to her if he could. But he knew it would take some time. He really did hope that she would check out the church later that night. So his approach was this, to invite her into a relationship, a slow relationship. He told his new friend, the investor told the gal, it was nice to meet you. I hope to see you there tonight. I'll be looking for you. And when she looked up from the ground, she couldn't even see him. He was gone. Later that evening, after taking a bus and a 10-mile journey down a busy street, she finally came to the Church of the Three Crosses, or so they call it on the streets. It's a church where they have three crosses out front, and so she entered in, and the, the meal was already served, but the nice kitchen volunteers gave her a meal anyway. And she snuck in kind of the back way, the back door, set in the back. And she wanted to eat, simply blend in, and eat and run. And to her surprise, she looked around to see people from all walks of life, some with nice clothes, others with tattered hand-me-downs from the thrift store. People from different rations, uh, nations and different races. It was though people had converged from the suburbs and the ghetto, and they went to one place and they called it church. She looked. She noticed Brian in his wheelchair with his hands outstretched. And she thought for a moment, maybe everything in my life is going to be okay. She looked for the investor but she couldn't find him in the crowd. And yet she felt like he was there. There was a comfort and peace that she had felt with him in the alley. And one of the pastor dudes got up to talk. She thought at first his name was Victor, but she soon realized it was a title, Vicar. She thinks his real name might have been Jeff or Joe or even Jake, but she couldn't remember but what she will always remember is what happened next. It's when the word of God hit this gal right in the chest. One of the vicars were preaching up a storm, engaged in the Bible, and talking about the free love that Jesus Christ gives to all people in this community. And she had been wrestling with her sin all day long. She had been pacing and walking around thinking, the good that I actually want to do, I just can't do. I keep trying, and it wrecked her to the core. It was the law just crushing her like I can't get better. She was an addict, but hey, aren't we all? Aren't we all addicted to something? Aren't we all addicts of sin? The preacher <laughs> brought it that night and applied it to each and every person's life there, saying that the Christian life begins and ends with God's grace. No more, no less. You can't earn it. It's a gift. Now go and be God's workmanship. And she heard the words of the Apostle Paul that took her back to a country church where she used to live in the Midwest years ago. And she heard it afresh. And you were dead in their trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived, in the passion of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. And she thought, <laughs> were dead once walked once lived were these are verbs in the past tense but her present tense reality was of shame was of guilt was of pain was of depression was of isolation and it hit her hardcore 
the preacher went on. And then she heard this good news. The unadulterated, complete, pure, sweet, good news gospel of God's grace is what she needed to hear. No more torment. No more law. No more, hey, do better. No more, hey, try harder. No more three steps to get out of homelessness. No more, come on, why did you screw up? And she didn't want it to be cheap grace because she was learning that grace is not cheap. It wasn't cheap for this one man 2,000 years ago that died in her place a costly death. And then she heard how God was an investor coming to earth to take on average flesh, average clothes, an average body, to invest in her his very life on a cross, his very life resurrected from a tomb, that he was rich in mercy, rich in kindness, rich in grace, to the least, the lost, the lonely, the marginalized, and those in suburbs and those in cities, male and female, slave and free, for all people. And she began to just weep. When's the last time you wept like that? To weep as she heard the preacher bring it home, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is a gift of God to you, not a result of works so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, she heard, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And she continued to weep over her sin and weep over God's grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. As she realized that faith was a gift given to her. And she didn't have it all figured out up here. She didn't have it all figured out here clearly. But that it was a gift given to her. And then from the recesses of her mind to the frontal part of her brain. She began to recall a memory from childhood. Where a guy in a white robe said simple words pouring water over her head. And saying you are baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are forgiven, child of the one true God. Then the vicar began to talk about how Jesus washed people's feet. And he called up those who wanted to have their feet washed. And she sat there in that chair. And then before you know it, she started to rise and start to walk toward the front. You know that feeling of like, why am I doing this? But it's happening and, and it's the Holy Spirit leading her. And she converged upon the pastor that was there that night. And they almost collided. And the pastor said, I'm going to wash your feet. And she said, she didn't know how she was saying this, but the Holy Spirit was working on her. And she just said, no, 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 no. I'm going to wash your feet. The pastor's like, no, I get paid to do this, you know. This is my role. I'm supposed to serve you. And she said, no, sit down. Let me wash your feet. And the gal began to wash this pastor's feet, and they both began to cry. And she started to share about the ins and outs of addiction. She began to share that her, her dad was in the hospital, and we need to pray. And she even interrupted the service after that to pray for, ask for prayer. And it was this beautiful moment. And she describes it as like, that was one of the first time in 10 years, this whole experience, when I felt real and saved and redeemed, and loved, and cared for, and secure in my Christian faith. And it was like she was thinking, maybe everything's going to be okay. Two years later, after coming back Tuesday after Tuesday, she found help. She went to a rehab through a partnership that helps addicts. Life wasn't easy, but it was getting better. She got an apartment through the resource center that was developed. And before you know it, she was feeling like it truly is going to be okay. And what seemed like one random day, she got a knock on the door. Who do you think it was? The investor. She looks to the people. She opens the door. And it was almost like, is this really happening? You know, you ever had that moment? Is this really going on? Are all these just coincidence? Or is this a God moment colliding into my future? And the investor simply said this. 
I have saved you by grace through faith. Go be my workmanship. And he pulls out his wallet and he hands her a check for about $1,000. And he says, I know you're good, but I want you to use my money, my resources. I'm the great investor. They're a gift to you. And I'm going to come back. You're not going to know when. And when I come back, I want to hear stories of how you've invested my money well and how you've cared for other people, how you've passed on this legacy of love, of leading, of giving, and of serving. And go, therefore, to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples who invest this money of time, talent, and resource in other people. Go wash feet. Friends, who's, who's the investor? You can't leave unless you say it. Jesus. Who's the gal? Man, you guys are good. You see, the gal is a lot of different stories from our La Mesa community, isn't it, guys? All string together, and I'm proud of you. Pastor Tim and I, we're proud of you for being a church on mission. That even if you haven't gone, you've supported financially the mission of a Tuesday night ministry to rock the hearts of so many different people, to hear the grace of God, and know that God is a great investor, that invest in the least and the lost and the lonely, and then that they get to go being empowered to invest in others, and yet you nailed it. It's also all of our stories. That God comes close to us, and sits with us, and sometimes He's just silent with us. And that's what we need, right? And then in time, <laughs> when we're ready, he says a little deeper to us, it's by grace you're saved through faith. All that you have is a gift. Go and invest it. And I'm going to show you where, and I'm going to show you how. We're proud of you for investing over the last two years with Join the Journey 2.0 to affect so many different people to beautify our campus, not for our sake, but for the sake of the community to come and hear the gospel, and then to go out on mission. Over the next three sermons, we're going to be unpacking a little bit more of our next three-year campaign, generosity campaign, called Live the Journey. And there's four key statements. The first one is basically Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, for it is by grace you are saved to be God's workmanship. The next three weeks, we're going to go over these, and we're going to be talking about these the next three years even as we live into it. It's also on the back of your bulletin. If you want to take it home and kind of say, this is my, our, our, our slogan, our core value, and what it is. Why don't you read these with me as we close? We will go to the extreme for others to experience the love of Jesus. We will do whatever it takes to empower everyone to become passionate Jesus followers. We will sacrifice anything to expand God's kingdom. Over the next three weeks, buckle up to be stretched into an invitation financially to sacrifice anything and everything. Challenge to be God's workmanship so that others would actually experience, maybe for the first time, God's undeserved grace love. And also to always remember as we enter in these conversations that it starts and it ends with grace. That's what Ryan Barlow, one of our newer members, believes and it's a part of his story and we close this message with hearing his his story check it out good morning my name is ryan barlow i'm a new member at christ greenfield lutheran church uh, i grew up in the uh, lds or mormon church um, and when i was a uh, senior in high school i had some friends point me to the concerned christians uh, and they gave me a booklet called a uh, witness to mormons which i read through and compared it to the lds doctrine god showed me his truth which is the bible is the only word of god and that uh, salvation is through faith in Jesus Christ. And I just look forward to living the journey with everyone here at Christ Greenfield Lutheran Church. Let's pray, isn't it? Yeah. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are so good. You're a God of undeserved grace and mercy given to us. We're all that gal. We all need you. Thank you for being the investor that inv invests in us with time, talent, and treasure. And always saying, it's by grace you are saved through faith. It's nothing you could do. No knowledge, 
nothing you can kind of earn a little bit and then I'll go the rest of the way. It's all gift, all the time. And we look forward, Lord, to giving our lives away as your workmanship created to do specific tasks and roles into this day and into the future that you have created and known before the creation of the world. Lord, may we be open to this invitation continually and always by grace. In Jesus' name we say, amen. 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 The peace of the Lord be with you. It is High Five Sunday. High five a few people. Get to know them. And if you don't know them, talk a little bit more. High five. Peace.